So this week's Pasha is Pasha's Nasa, page 749. It begins in chapter 4, verse 21 in Bamidbar. So it begins, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, Take a census of the sons of Gershon as well, according to their father's household, according to their families. So last week's Pasha, Pasha's Bamidbar, we had a census of the Jewish people. We had a census of the Levium, of the Levites, from the age of 30 days and up. Now we're in the middle of a census of the, of the working Levites from, I think, 30 to 50. And we already had a we already had the census and assignments of the family of Kahas. Now we're moving on to the next family, the family of Gershon. So um, this is their census and their work assignments. So it states in, in verse 23, from 30 years of age and up until 50 years of age, shall you count them, everyone who comes to join the legion to perform work in the tent of meeting. This is the work of the Gershonite families to work and to carry. They shall carry the curtains of the tabernacle in the tent of meeting, its cover, and the tachash cover that is, that is over it from above, and the screen at the entrance of the tent of meeting, the lace hanging in the courtyard, and the screen at the entrance of the gate of the courtyard that were around the courtyard and the altar, the ropes and all the utensils of their service and everything that was made for them, and they shall serve. So um, the family of Gershon, their assignment was especially carrying the ta tabernacle, the tabernacle being a portable sanctuary. So it didn't have a fixed roof. It was covered with tapestries. And um, so the retaining wall around the tabernacle were tapestries. And um, so that was the job of the family of Gershon was to carry those tapestries and um, covers of the building. So that is um, Gershon. So now the next family of Levites, the third one is Merari. So in verse 21, the sons of Merari, according to their families, according to their father's household, shall you count them, etc. And in verse 31, this is the charge of their burden for all their work in the tent of meeting, the planks of the tabernacle, its bars, its pill pillars, and its sockets, the pillars of the courtyard all around in their sockets, their pegs and the ropes for all the utensils for all their work. So um, whereas we saw before that last week's Parsha says that the family of Kahas was assigned carrying the holy vessels, the family of Gershon we just saw were assigned carrying the tapestries, the family of um, Merari were assigned carrying, they did the heavy lifting, they were carrying the beams and the, you know, the real building material. So it continues in, um, where is it? And at the end of verse 32, it, can, it states, you shall appoint them by name to the utensils they are to carry on their watch. That's a very interesting phrase, that you shall appoint them by name. And then the commentaries explain that, that it wasn't, it wasn't just that the job was given to each family, you know, like you carry, um, you got to carry all these tapestries. Every individual was given a specific job. And this was true about all the Levim, all the Levites and all the families is that each individual levy was given a specific job for himself to do, and it was non-transferable. He wasn't allowed to trade with somebody else. And the Ramban says that this is true by all the Levim, but it was written specifically by Merari because the Merari were carrying the heavy stuff. They were carrying the, the beams, the building material. So you would think that they might trade to lighten the, their burden, and that's what, um, so the Torah is saying that it was assigned by name that every person had a specific job and it was non-transferable. Okay, and then it goes through the count and skipping a little bit to um, page 751, chapter five, verse one. So the bottom of page 751, chapter five, begins, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, command the children of Israel that they shall expel from the camp Everyone with saras, that's everyone with this spiritual leprosy. Um, everyone who had a zav emission and everyone contaminated by a human corpse. A zav emission means for a male would mean that they had a um, something that's similar to seminal emission, but um, it, do, it doesn't come from any arousal. So it's where any kind of liquid flows from their um, genitals without any arousal tr triggering that. And for female, it would be if she has blood come out of her genitals, but not at a not at a normal time. So in both those cases, the they would be rendered um, ritually impure, and it says they would have to leave the camp. 
And, it can, and also someone who's contaminated by a human corpse. And in verse three, male and female alike shall you expel to the outside of the camp shall expel them so they should not contaminate the camps among which I dwell. And it, can, and it concludes that the children of Israel did so, they expelled to the outside of the camp as Hashem had spoken to Moshe. So did the children of Israel do. So they did this with joy, and it seems that there wasn't any fighting over the people who were being expelled. And to be clear, the Rashi explains that there, it wasn't that these people had to be expelled outside the entire camp, that there were actually three levels of, um, of holiness within the camp. Those three levels were the Israelite camp. That's where the regular people lived in the camp. Then that, and that was an outer ring around the tabernacle. Then the Levite camp was an inner ring around the tabernacle, and um, that was called the Levite camp. And then there was the tabernacle itself within the retaining wall around the courtyard of the tabernacle that was called the, um, the, the camp of the Shrina of the Divine Presence. And there were three levels of impurity mentioned here. The first one is the Mitzora, the, um, the leper, or the, the one with the spiritual ritual leprosy. So he was expelled outside all the camps. And he had to go even outside the Israelite camp, really outside of where people were settled in the desert. Then there was the Levite camp where the Levites were living. And anybody with this middle level, which is it calls has a Zav emission, which includes anybody who's in, who has ritual impurity through um, any substance leaving their body. So that would be the, the ones that we mentioned for the most part. Um, so they would have to leave the, this, the camp of the, they would have to be outside the camp of the Levites, but they could be in the regular Israelite camp. They weren't expelled from the Israelite camp. They could let stay at home in the Israelite camp. And the third level was um, someone, cont someone contaminated by a human corpse. They were even allowed in the Levite camp. They were just not allowed in the tabernacle grounds it itself. So that, those are the three levels. And each of these um, spiritual or ritual contaminations mentioned are three different levels of where they're allowed to go. And in the, so this was in the, when we had the tabernacle and we were encamped around it in the desert. But there was an equivalent also in the um, Beis Amikdash in the temple. And um, the Rambam speaks out that um, the whole city of Yerushalayim, he says from the gates of the city of Yerushalayim and inward, I'm assuming he would, by the gates of the city, he means the old city, I can't verify that. But the Rambam says that from the gates inward is considered the Israelite camp. So Mitzora, someone who has this ritual leprosy would have to go outside that. The middle level, the, the equivalent of the Levite um, camp, would be um, from the, the Temple Mount, on the Temple Mount, but, out, but outside the courtyard of the, of the, um, of the Beis Amikdash, it's the courtyard of the Temple. So there, was, there were a few yards before you got to the courtyard of the tabernacle where the offerings were brought. And outside of that would be called the, anywhere on the temple might, but outside the courtyard would be called the Levite camp. So anyone who was contaminated with any kind of admissions were not allowed into that, into that area. And the third level is the, um, is the, from the courtyard of the temple and inward, and anyone who's even impure through contact with a dead body is not allowed to go there. So nowadays, we could become pure from any of these emission type of impurities. We would become pure by dipping in a mikveh at the appropriate time, depending on what it was. That would be enough to make us pure. So we could really go into the Levite camp by dipping in the mikveh if we knew what we were doing. But all of us would be assumed to have come in contact with the dead body at some point, either through you know dealing with one or being at the cemetery. And we don't have the means to purify ourselves from that because we don't have the red heifer, and um, which is part of the ritual purification for, contact, for impurity through contact with the dead. And therefore, it would be prohibited for us to go in the Temple Mount into that area. And because we don't necessarily know where exactly that area is, so um, it was not advised to go on the uh, to go on the grounds of the Temple Mount until you really know where you do where you're going and what you're doing. Okay, so moving on. Um, verse on page seven fifty three, verse five. So it begins. Um, and Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, "Speak to the children of Israel: a man or a woman who, be, who commits any of man's sins." 
by committing treachery towards Hashem, and that person shall become guilty. It continues, they shall confess the sin that they committed. He shall make restitution for his guilt and its principal amount and add a fifth to it and give it to the one to whom he is, in, he is indebted. Our sages understand this to be talking about a person who stole. So they stole something and then they, conf and then they swore falsely. They were accused of stealing and they were brought for an oath and they swore falsely. And um, then afterwards they wanted to do tshuva. They confessed their sin and they want to make restitution. So the Torah says they have to make restitution by paying the amount that they stole plus add one fifth to that amount and give it to the one whom he has indebted, the person they stole it. So now in verse eight, if the man has no kinsman to whom the debt can be returned, let's say the person someone stole from somebody and that person died. The victim of the, of the robbery died, not through his hand, but the victim of the robbery had died in the meantime. And he doesn't have anyone to inherit him. So our sages ask, how does someone not have anyone to inherit him? There are, the laws of inheritance are very complex, but they're basically anybody who's Jewish has inheritors because you go back generations if you can't go to the next generation. So to that they answer, the only person, the only way it's possible for a Jew not to have anyone who can inherit them is if you have a convert who does not have a, a wife or children. So in that case, a convert, so he's detached from his any of his previous attachments from before he converted. So his relatives from the past aren't his relatives. And if he doesn't have any new ones, if he doesn't have a wife or children, so um, that person is, is has no inheritance. So if someone were to steal from a convert who does not have anyone to inherit from him, and then the convert were to die before he was paid back, so then it says the return debt is for Hashem, for the Kohen. Aside for the ram of atonement, she shall provide him atonement. He has to bring a ram as a, an offering, but and pay the amount that he stole to the Kohen. And in verse 9, and every portion from any of the holies that the children of Israel bring to the Kohen shall be his. Um, a man's holies shall be his, and what a man gives to the Kohen shall be his. So just to explain this before I go back over this whole section, because there's a lot, it sounds like three very different topics going on all at once. But this last section, starting from verse 9, every portion from any of the holies that the children of Israel bring to the coin shall be his. Um, on a simple level, this means that um, a person has a choice that there are certain mitzvahs of, that we have to give things to the coin. For example, we have to give a, a percentage of our crops, let's say 60% or um, 50, um, 40, 50, or 60% of the crops as truma. That's a gift for the Kohen. So one may think that since it's a, it belongs to the Kohanim, so a Kohen could just come to our field and say, I'm here, let's have that truma. So the Torah is telling us that he can't do that. And the, a person's holies belong to him, meaning that um, Torah calls it tovas hana, which means that a, the owner of the field has the right to choose which Kohen gets his truma, gets his portions, that even though the portions belong to the Kohanim collectively, but the owner is allowed to designate which Kohen or Kohanim are to receive it. And it concludes, a man's holy shall be his and what a man gives to the Kohen shall be his. So our sages derive from that, that there are two, they, there are two different way, um, connections really that they make there. Then a man's holy shall be his and what a man gives to the Kohen shall be his. So on a man's holy shall be his, they say that what is it that a person's obligated to give? I said to the Kohen, he's obligated to give let's say 140th, 150th, or 160th, and to Levi, he has to give one-tenth so of his crops, which is a significant amount. One-tenth of a person's crops is a significant amount. And um, so the Torah is saying that if a person doesn't do it, so then his holies will be his, means that the amount that he was expected to give to begin with, that's all he'll end up with. Meaning if a person doesn't, if a person refuses to give his one sixtieth of his crops to the Kohen, let's say, or his one tenth to the Levi, eventually he'll only end up with one one tenth of what he was his field was supposed to produce. It'll only produce the amount that he was supposed to give anyway. And it concludes: when a man gives to the Kohen, shall be his. Um, our sages derive that if a man what a man gives to the Kohen, he will have meaning that he'll have substance if he gives to the Kohen. He'll be he'll have wealth if he gives the donations he's supposed to give to a Kohen. And just a story that I heard about um, the mirror, which I've also heard isn't true, but it's a great story anyway. But um, I heard a story that the previous Rosh Hashiva of the mirror, that when, when I was there in the mirror in Israel, 
The Shiva was Ramnasan Sri Finkel, who was an incredible, incredible man. He was, um, he did not grow up in a, in a um, yeshiva environment. He actually grew up in Chicago. And he went to Jewish schools, but not necessarily a yeshiva per se. And um, he was family with the, um, with the with the administration in the mirror in Israel. And he went there and they took great care of him and he became a yeshiva. But he had um, debilitating Parkinson's very young, I think in his 50s or maybe even earlier. And when I went there, he wasn't that old. He was probably 60s and he was completely taken by Parkinson's. He was, I mean, his mind was clear, but he was waving, or you could, he was just waving like to talk to him. He's like, just in front of, that's how he was able to sit, just like moving all over the place. And yet he didn't let it take away at all from his studying and from his running the yeshiva. But he was the world's greatest fundraiser also, because who's gonna say no to him when he sits across from somebody and as for a donation, how could they say no if they see how much he's putting in with such a debilitating disease? He's putting in all his uh, all his being into the yeshiva. It's very hard to, he, nobody could say no. And they say that he once called a donor and said the yeshiva is in a diff very difficult time and we need a $20 million loan to keep the yeshiva going. This is a tremendous, a big yeshiva. Which it's a yeshiva that has 10,000, 15,000 students overall in Israel. And it's... Um, so he, he told the big donor that this, we need this money. And the donor said, Rabbi, I, wealthy people don't have money like that. We have, it's all tied up in other assets. We don't have cash that we could just take out and, you know, and lend to the yeshiva. And he insisted, the yeshiva insisted, he said that we need this to, to function. And eventually the, the guy, the donor told him, I'll see what I could do. And he managed to pull together $20 million. and um, and gave it as a loan to the yeshiva. A few months later, the financial situation in the country and the world went very far south. This is when the recession hit. And uh, when was it? 2008, whatever it was. And um, the person's assets were just wiped out. And all he had left, pretty much all he had left was that money that he lent to the yeshiva. And the yeshiva paid him back. He said that this is all I have now. But everything else was that was tied up in these investments, those all went south. All he had left is what he lent to the yeshiva. And um, this just illustrates this point that what a person gives to the Kohen, what a person gives to charity, that's assets that he always has. You can't take that away from a person. That the spiritual assets that a person accrues never de um, depreciates, it never goes away. And But I also wanted to talk about the connection between these these things in this little section, starting from verse five, it says that if a man commits sins, if a man steals, how he pays back. Then it talks about if a person steals from somebody who doesn't have any inheritors, how he pays back. And then it talks about a um, someone who withholds donations that he's supposed to give to the Kohen. And um, I think the Ramban says that the connection between all these things is the Torah is trying to tell us that the problem with stealing that a person might, might think that what does stealing mean? We're depriving some, someone of something that they had. And now they don't, they don't have the, that money and they have to find a way to function without it. And we're hurting a person by taking stuff away. But if we take something away without hurting somebody, let's say we have someone who's a very wealthy man and he won't even notice if he's gone. It won't affect his life, lifestyle at all. So one may start looking, finding heterium, as we call it. They might start finding um, loopholes in their thinking as to why it's not so bad. And here the Torah is telling us that um, taking away for, that if someone took away from a convert and that convert died and they have no inheritors, so one may think that nobody's hurt now because he's, he's dead already and um, there's nobody who's missing this money. So how do, why should I need to make restitution? Still the Torah says he has to give it to the coin. And if someone deprived Kohanim of their donations, it's not like the Kohanim had it already, that we're taking something away from them. We're just not giving something that the Torah commands us to give. And yet still the Torah takes it so seriously. And the Torah is trying to tell us that the problem with stealing is not that we're hurting somebody else by taking something away from them. The problem with stealing is that the Hashem gives us everything that we're entitled to. 
And if we take something that Hashem, that wasn't given to us by Hashem or uh, allowed to us by Hashem in a legitimate way, that is, um, in, in a sense, denying the, um, the supervision of Hashem over the world. And that is wrong on its, its own right, that the stealing is wrong for us. It doesn't matter how it affects the other person, it's wrong. Okay, so now moving on. In verse 11, the wayward wife, the bottom of page 753, verse 11. So it states, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, any man whose wife shall go astray and commit treachery against him. So now we're talking about a wayward and unfaithful wife. And in verse 13 on page 755, and a man could have lain with her carnally, but it was hidden from the eyes of her husband. She became secluded and could, could have been defiled, but there was no witness against her and she had not been forced. And in verse 14, a, and the spirit of jealousy had passed over him. He had warned his wife and she had become defiled. Or a spirit of jealousy had, had passed over him and he had warned his wife and she had not become defiled. And I'll explain, these verses are very hard to parse. I'll explain in a minute. But in verse 15, it continues, the man shall bring his wife to the Kohen and he shall bring her offering up for her. Okay, so, and then he, he brings her to Kohen and they go through the ritual of the water for the Sota, for the unfaithful wife. So um, the, our sages deal with, with, with the connection here, that we're moving from the gifts to the Kohanim to the unfaithful wife. What's the connection there? What's the, um, what's the continuation? And to that, our um, Rashi comments, he brings a statement from the Medrash that um, if a person doesn't bring the gifts that a Kohen is, is entitled to, so in the end, he'll have to go to the Kohen for a different reason. Meaning that a person, if a person is not bringing the gifts to the Kohen, he's kind of making a statement that I don't need the Kohen. What do I need them for? And leave them alone. So in the end, he'll end up needing the Kohen. He'll end up needing them for a problem in his house where um, he'll have, his wife will be unfaithful and he'll bring, he'll need to bring her to the Kohen to perform this ritual. Okay. And as, it, as I said, these verses are hard to parse, but just in short, what it means here is that if we're talking about a case where a man suspected his wife of being unfaithful with a specific person. And he warns his wife, do not be, do not seclude yourself with that person. Don't let yourself be alone with that person. And then he has witnesses that she actually, so again, he has witnesses to the warning, the fact that he warned her. And he has witnesses to the fact that following his warning, she did in fact seclude herself with that man. She, 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 made, she went alone with that man. And there were no witnesses against her means that they don't have witnesses as to an actual act of adultery, but we have this um, suspicious circumstances. We have the, um, what do they call it? The, um, what's it called, something evidence. The, yeah. Circumstantial. Thank you, thank you, Frank. Yeah, we have the circumstantial evidence. So, um, so we have the circumstantial evidence, but we don't have absolute proof. But the evidence, it has to be that he had warned her already in front of witnesses. And following the warning, there are witnesses that she secluded herself, herself with him in spite of the warning. So they bring an offering. It's called a, a, a barley flour. It states in verse 15, the man shall bring his wife to the cone. He shall bring her offering for her. A tenth and eighth of barley flour. He shall not pour oil over it and he shall not put frankincense upon it. We don't make this oil, this offering in a beautiful way with the oil and the frankincense, for it is a meal offering of jealousies, a meal offering of remembrance, a reminder of iniquity. And then the, in verse 16, the coin shall bring her near, have her stand before Hashem. The coin shall take sacred water in an earthenware vessel, and the coin shall take it, take from the earth that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it in the water. The coin shall have the woman before, shall, I'm sorry, shall stand the woman before Hashem and cover the woman's head, and upon her hands he shall put the meal offering of remembrance. On page 757, it is a meal offering of jealousies. In the hands of the coin shall be the bitter waters that cause a curse. And the bitterness, I say, say, is that it causes a curse. And the coin shall adjure her and say to the woman, if a man is not laid with you and you have not strayed in defilement with someone other than your husband, then you shall be innocent of these bitter waters that cause curse. But if you have strayed with someone other than your husband and you have, if you have become defiled and the man other than your husband is laid, laid with you, he shall adjure her, saying, May Hashem render you as a curse and an oath amid your people. When Hashem causes your thigh to collapse and your stomach to distend, these waters that could cause curse shall enter your innards and cause the stomach to distend and thigh to collapse. And the woman shall answer, so say, say, Amen, Amen. 
So he gives her this very strong warning about what's to happen. And the hope this whole time is that if she was guilty, she would confess. In which case, if she would confesses, so then she, the husband would have to divorce her and she would not get her suba. She would not get her the money that's in the marriage contract in case of a divorce. But that's the end of it. If she were to confess, that's the end of it. And it continues in verse 23. But if she continues, it says, the Kohen shall inscribe these curses on a scroll and erase it into the bitter waters. And it, what's amazing is included in these curses is the word, the, words of Hashem, the word Hashem, the name of Hashem, which usually we treat with the ultimate reverence and we're prohibited from ever erasing. But in this case, our sages say that in order to make peace between man and wife, that if they don't go through this ritual, the husband will always suspect his wife. And this will either prove her innocent or guilty. So it has the potential of bringing peace between a man and his wife, in which case it's, Hashem says it's worth it that his name should be erased. And um, it, they erase in the waters and um, then the woman drinks and either one, one thing or the other happens. Either she, her stomach, her thighs collapse and her stomach distends, basically she explodes, her stomach explodes. Or in verse 26, but if the woman had not become defiled, let's say she is in fact innocent and she is pure, then she shall be proven innocent and she shall bear seed. And, um, okay, so now moving on to page 759. And just as, as an aside, I say to say that, let's say the man had acted improperly during the marriage. So there's, we don't have this, um, we don't have this ritual for the, for the wife to impose on her husband. But our sages say that if he was, in fact, unfaithful, unfaithful as well, the test doesn't work on her. And um, she, she wouldn't have this punishment, even if she was, in fact, guilty. Okay, and moving on, page 759, chapter 6. Next comes the section of the Nazarite, someone who takes upon themselves a Nazarite vow. Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, a man or a woman who shall disassociate disassociate himself by taking a Nazarite vow of abstinence from the, from, for the sake of Hashem. Sorry, from new or aged wine shall he abstain and he shall not drink vinegar or wine or, um, and, age, and dried grapes he shall not eat. I'm sorry, vinegar of aged wine, etc. You can't drink any, basically any grape products. You can't drink any wine. Or, um, and in verse 5, all the days of the Nazarite vow, a razor shall not pass over his head. He's not allowed to cut his hair. And in verse 6, all the days of abstinence for the sake of Hashem shall not come near a dead person. To his father, to his mother, to his brother, sister, he shall not contaminate himself. All the days of his abstinence is holy to Hashem. So the Nazarite vow precludes three things, drinking any wine or any grape products, um, having cutting his hair, or um, coming in contact with the dead. Those are the three things that he prohibits to himself if he's a Nazarite. And as it says, the days of his Nazarite good. And that's because the usual case of a Nazarite, a person was only a Nazarite for a certain length of time. I think the Talmud says that the, re, the, the regular Nazarite vow would be for 30 days. So a person would say, I'll be a Nazarite, uh, a person would say that they would be a Nazarite for 30 days. That would be, or even if a person said that they're going to be a Nazarite, so it's assumed that they mean for 30 days until they say otherwise. And afterwards they go through a purification process and there's no, they're no longer a Nazir. There were exceptions of people who are in Nazir's their whole life, the famous one being Shimshon Samson, which is the topic of the Haftarah. So here also I say to say, what's the connection? What's the continuation? Why does this come after the Sota, after the section of the unfaithful wife? wife? And I say to say, because if a person sees the Sota, sees this unfaithful wife going through this disgrace, um, they, that person should cause themselves to be, um, they should be, make a Nazarite vow. They should make themselves another, a Nazar. And when sages explain what's the reasoning behind this, is because that if a person sees a, um, the unfaithful wife in her punishment and disgrace, so they would say that what, is, what, what causes such a thing? That usually, uh, very often it's caused by excess imbibing in alcohol, causes people to lose their, their sense of judgment and cause them to go astray. So such a person would, um, if they see this sota, they say that was caused by, that maybe was caused by too much um, imbibing in alcoholic beverages. So they'll um, make themselves a nazir to prohibit wine upon themselves.
And the commentaries ask that one would think that it would be the opposite. That if somebody saw the sota, if someone saw this, this woman going through this, this painful and disgraceful punishment, you would think that he doesn't need the Nazarite vow. He saw the result. He saw what could happen from it. And the one who needs it is the opposite. The one who needs this vow is someone who didn't see that. And therefore, they don't have that guard. A person who saw it has that in front of his eyes. He had, he's experienced what it looks like for someone who gets carried away. So he'll need extra, extra vigilance. Why is it specifically him who needs to, who would make the Nazarite vow? So our sages answer that it's a, um, this is really a foundational idea in everything we do, really. And um, foundational idea behind the ways of the Jewish religion, which is, that we always try to distance ourselves from temptation and from possibility of sin. Because we take sin, we have fear of God and fear of sin. We take to us sinning, performing, doing a sin is something serious. It's something that we very strongly want to avoid. And if someone strongly wants to avoid something, if a person considers something dangerous, they don't play around with it. And if they see someone else, let's say, um, being hurt, doing something dangerous. So that they don't take that as, oh, now I know to be extra careful, so I'll be okay doing that. They take that as, stay, I'll stay far away. For example, if let's say you have a cliff and um, some people, you know, someone was walking close to the edge of the cliff and they fell off the cliff. So someone who saw that isn't going to say, well, I saw him fall off the cliff, so I see what could happen, so I'll be extra careful. So I don't need to worry about getting close to the edge. Someone who saw someone fall off the cliff will stay far away from that edge. They'll stay far away from the edge of the cliff so they don't fall off. And that's true in this case as well. That if we take sinning seriously, that sinning, sin is something that we want to avoid and it's not something to play around with. So then if we saw someone fall into sin, our reaction would not be, I'm safe because I saw what bad things could happen. The reaction is, I have to avoid that. I see that that's dangerous and it's something I have to, I have to stay away from that. And therefore they'll make themselves another from wine. Interestingly, there are sages say that it's only somebody who saw this, who saw the Sota's fall, this unfaithful wife's fall should make themselves another. But someone who didn't, it would be a sin for them to make themselves another. And I saw that explained is that a nazar is like, a, uh, is a double-edged sword in a sense that it's, 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 it's dangerous in its own right. And that's because when a person makes themselves a Nazar, they're making additional things prohibited to themselves. If, a person, if you have a person who's not a Nazar, not a Nazarite, they're allowed to drink wine. They're allowed to cut their hair. They're allowed to go close to the dead. They're allowed to come in contact with the dead. And not to a Nazar, that's prohibited by Torah law. Once a person um, pronounces themselves a Nazar, these things become prohibited to him by Torah law. So now there are more areas he caused him, he surrounded himself with cliffs in a sense. There are more areas for him to slip up and to fall. And therefore, if, a, if in a case of necessity, if a person sees a danger in front of him, like if he sees the Sota in her downfall, in that case, it's appropriate for him to say, I have to stay away from that and to make himself another. But in other cases, he's just building cliffs around himself, giving him opportunities to fall. In, in that case, it's a bad thing. Okay, so now continuing on with this Nazarite. Um, it discusses what happens if he violates it accidentally. Let's say he's in a, he's in, he's, um, let's say walking in the street and someone dies right next to him under a tree where he's the, um, the impurity through contact with it, or if he's in a room and someone, he's in, and he's in a house and someone died in the house, God forbid. So now he came in contact with the dead body through no fault of his own. So it goes through the purification process and he has to start his Nazarite over, his terms over. And on page 761, verse 13, when he completes his turn, and on verse 13, this shall be the law of the Nazarite on the day of his abstinence is completed. Let's say he became a Nazarite for 30 days. The 30 days are up. He kept it the way he should have. He shall bring himself to the entrance of the tent of meeting. He shall bring his offering to Hashem, one unblemished sheep in his first year as an elevation offering, one unblemished you, that's a female sheep, in his first year as a sin offering, and one unblemished ram as a peace offering. So our sages asked, why is it he's bringing a sin offering? What sin did he commit? It seems that he did something very admirable by becoming a Nazir. So the um, Ramban says, or actually I'll start with the Klayaka says, something similar to what we expressed before, is that 
um, Hashem gave us these things in the world for us to use. And everything in the world is here for us to use or avoid, as whatever the case may be, as a challenge or for our use. But wine is both. Wine is something that could be abused and we have to stay away from its abuse, but it's also there for us to use. It could be, it could be used as a comfort in the times of mourning, or it can be used as a something to celebrate in times of celebration. And we can use it for mitzvahs, we can use it for kiddush, we can at a at a bris milah, we or havdala or a wedding. They're all made over a cup of wine. And um, so, and Hashem put these things in the world for our use. And this person caused himself difficulty. And just for that, the fact that he caused himself difficulty and the pain of not being able to drink wine, so um, he would bring this sin offering. And additionally, he adds in is that he also created new Yetzirahs for himself. Is that until now, these things weren't prohibited. Now these things are prohibited. So now he has a new Yetzirah, and now he has to be careful to stay away from wine. It's another challenge that he brought on himself, perhaps unnecessarily. So that's the Kliyaka. The Ramban, though, explains that the reason why he's bringing a sin offering is because a Nazir, when he's a Nazir, through his, this vow that detached him from wine and haircuts, etc., he comes more spiritual. He's a more spiritual person during his terms of Nazirite. He's more detached from the physical. And um, when he it's over, what's he doing? He, it's it's like he's going back to the previous level. He's 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 leaving this level of spirituality that he attained, and therefore he has to bring a sin offering just for that, just for for just for dropping a level of spirituality by saying I was I, I was holy then, and I'm going to be less holy now. So he brings a sin offering for that. Okay. So now moving on, it gives the process of how he goes back to normal. And um, on page 763, verse 22, it states, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, speak to Aaron and his son saying, so shall you bless the children of Israel saying to them, may Hashem bless you and safeguard you. <clears throat> may Hashem illuminate his countenance for you and be gracious to you. And may Hashem lift his countenance to you and establish peace for you. This should be familiar as the blessing the Kohanim bless us with here on the holidays, on, y on Yantav. And it continues in verse 27, let them place my name upon the children of Israel and I shall bless them. So, um, and the, the, so um, there's an introduction and a conclusion here. And the introduction before the blessing was, speak to the sons, speak to Aaron and his sons saying, so shall you bless the children of Israel, saying to them. And in verse 27, it concludes, let them place my name upon the, upon the children of Israel and I shall bless them. And the Kaliyaka explains this, quoting from our sages, that in the introduction, where it says, May, um, so shall you bless the children of Israel, sing to them. Literally, the Hebrew is, um, in Pesach of Gimel, verse 23, so shall you bless the children of Israel, emor lahem, say to them the following, and our sages say that this emor lahem, say to them, is a, the source that we have the chazan, lead the Kohanim in the blessings, which you would think the Chazan isn't a Kohen. The, um, so why is it that the Chazan says each word, the Chazan said, and, the, and then the Kohanim repeat after him, why is the Chazan involved? You would think it's just the Kohanim should bless them, should bless the congregation, should bless us. And um, he says, this you shall say to them is talking to the Chazan, that the Chazan, the leader, should proclaim the blessings and the Kohanim repeat it. And the reason for that is, is that the Kohanim are blessing us, but who's blessing the Kohanim? And especially since our sages say that what's the greatest source of blessing? If you have a person, a wretched person, who has everything goes bad for them, that person can't give a good blessing. That person's blessing would be a blessing like, you know, you shouldn't have too much pain today. And, you know, different people at different stages of their life and different um, levels of comfort, different, they have different ideas about what a blessing is, what's blessed, that a blessing of one person might be a curse for another person. So, um, so we want the Kohanim to be full of blessing in order to bless us. And there's an expression they use, which is a beautiful expression. It's, usually, it's something that people say about the idea of a kolo to begin with. And that is that when you have a, a cup, that an empty cup, you can't fill anything up, uh, anything else up from an empty cup. If you want to fill things up, the best way 
is if you have an if you fill up a cup till it's overflowing, then it overflows and gives everyone else water. And that's kind of the idea of a kolel is that the kolel, the rabbis of the kolel study, and through their study, they have what to give to others, and they 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 have what the Torah to spread. But if the if the kolel is just teaching and neglects themselves, neglects their own study, so then you you end up with an empty vessel that can't fill up anything else. And in this case, it's true about blessing, that first, if the Kohanim are empty of blessing, they, have, they can't give blessing. And we, so the Chazan, when the Chazan says, pronounces, Yivarechecha, Yivarechecha, so the Chazan is, give, is gi giving that blessing to the Kohanim in order that they're full of blessing themselves and could spread that blessing to us as well. And that's why it concludes that in verse 27, let them place my name upon the children of Israel and I shall bless them. That's Hashem saying that he'll bless the, they'll pronounce the name of Hashem on the children of Israel and Hashem will bless the Kohanim in order that they could spread that blessing to us. Okay, so now moving on, the Pasha concludes with a long conclusion. At 765, it goes all the way through 773. It discusses the offerings that the Nisim, that the um, that the princes, the leaders of each tribe, gave for the inauguration of the tabernacle. And it begins. I'm not going to go through all of it, but just the beginning in page, chapter seven um, on page 765. It was on the day that Moshe finished erecting the tabernacle that he anointed, sanctified it in all its utensils, and the altar in all its utensils, and he had anointed and sanctified them. The leaders of Israel, the heads of the father's household, brought offerings. They were the leaders of the tribes. They were those who were standing at the counting. They were the ones who were appointed to assist Moshe with counting the, uh, to, with the census. And they brought their offerings before Hashem, six covered wa wagons and 12 oxen, a wagon for each of the two leaders, and an ox for each. And it continues on page um, 767. Verse 10, then the leaders brought forward offerings for the dedication of the altar and the day was anointed and the leaders brought their offering before the altar. Hashem said to Moshe, one leader each day, one leader each day shall bring their offering for the dedication of the altar. So each tribe's leader had one day that he brought his offering. The following day, the leader of a different tribe, the next tribe brought his offering. And in verse 12, we'll just see the first one, but they all brought an identical offering. It says, the one who brought his offering on the first day was Nachshan, son of Aminadav of the tribe of Yehuda. His offering was one silver bowl at its weight, 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, and the sacred shekel, both of them filled with fine flour mixed with oil for meal offering, one gold ladle of 10 shekels filled with incense, one young bull, one ram, one sheep in his first year for an elevation offering, one he goat for sin offering and for the feast offering, two cattle, five rams, five he goats, five sheep in their first year. This is the offering of Nachshan, son, son of Aminadav. And he brought on the first day and the following days, the leader of each tribe brought the, the, an identical offering. So the commentaries ask, so if that's the case, why does the Torah need to specify each one? Why doesn't it just say that? That this is the what each one brought and maybe say the order, that he brought the first day, he brought the second day, he brought the third day, and they all brought this offering. So the Ramban says, first of all, that because they were very righteous and the Hashem wants to give honor to the righteous people, so... It gives them honor by enumerating their offering as a um, on their own. And they have like their moment to shine in the Torah. But um, the, the Ramban also says that um, even though the offerings were identical, but there's meaning behind everything about the offerings, that the, that the fact that they brought a bull, its weight, its volume, what was inside and its material, all that was meaningful. And each of the leaders of the tribe their intention, they had different intentions. They're different. Um, there was different meaning for each one. And it, they happened to, the, to correspond to the same amount, but each one had a meaning based on their tribe and based on who they were. And that's why it enumerates it separately, because even though physically it was the same thing, but the intention behind each gift was different for each tribe. And um, another thing I wanted to mention about this is that um, why were why was it that these um, that the leaders are giving these offerings? Why are they giving these offerings to inaugurate the Mishkan, to inaugurate the tabernacle? So our sages say is that when originally Moshe solicited donations to build the tabernacle, so we learned that the leaders of the tribes 
did not give immediately. Instead, they said, let's sit back and we'll see what's missing. We'll see what's not donated and we'll give that. We'll just make sure we have everything by waiting and to see what's missing. And at the end of the day, the people, the rest of the people gave everything that was needed aside for the stone, the fillings, the stones for the, um, aside for a few things. So um, because of that, when they, they felt very disturbed by this and they were criticized by the Torah, but they felt disturbed by this, that they lost that opportunity to give. So now that there was an inauguration of the Mishkan, so now they were inspired. We better get our act together and donate right now because who knows if we'll have an opportunity. And I saw, I forgot where, who I saw it from. It was probably the Sersei Chaim that, um, that the sages say that, or the verse really says that Sheva Yipal Tzadik become, that the, um, the righteous fall seven times and they get up. Meaning that, they, that the righteous has, um, they, they falter, that they, they, everyone makes mistakes. Even the most righteous makes mistakes. The righteous make seven make mistakes seven times and they get up. So I saw Rav Hutner said about this that he said that fools say that fools interpret this verse to be saying that the, that that's what makes them righteous. What makes them righteous is that in, in spite of the fact that they fell, they still got up. And that's the difference between the righteous and the not righteous is that the righteous are able to pull themselves up after they fail, after they make mistakes, after they do sin. They're able to pull themselves up. Whereas the, whereas the people who are not righteous don't do that. They, don't, they can't pull the will together to, to get up after they get knocked down, after they make mistakes. And he says, that's what fools think. He says, in reality, what this verse is telling us is that that's what made them righteous. He's saying they could never have been so righteous without these failures. And a person learns from their mistakes, not just to avoid the, avoid the mistakes that they made previously, but a person grows from mistakes. And when we, when everyone fails, everyone makes mistakes. And when we, when we fail, it's not just, it's not just a, um, a chance to demonstrate that we could get up to where we were before, but a, a, a mistake, a failure should be an opportunity to become greater than we were before. We could say, look, I failed and I still got back up and that, that, and I demonstrated strength that I didn't know I had before. And now I could be even greater as a result of the failure and the getting up. And that's what the verse means. And in this case, this is brought as an example of this, that the Nisim, that the leaders of the tribes, they, they failed. They made a mistake. They did not give immediately when Moshe solicited donations for the Mishkan, which is what they should have done. They should have come running with excitement and said, we want to give, let's give. Uh, but they didn't do that. And they, they fell. But they got up. And as a result of them getting up, they, had, they each they gave these beautiful offerings and the Torah attests to their importance by enumerating each one separately in spite of the fact that um, they're all the same. Okay, and the Parsha ends with this and keep on turning. It's the longest Parsha in the Torah, mostly because of these pages of repetition, but like we said, there's importance to it. And it sums it up. And on page 773, verse 89, it concludes... When Moshe arrived at the tent of meeting to speak with him, he heard the voice speaking to him from atop the cover that was on the Ark of the Testimony, from between, between the two Truven, between the, the two Kruven, and he spoke to him. And next week's Parsha continues with how he spoke. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Haftarah. The Haftarah is in the Stone Chumash on page 1181. It's from, um, it's from the book of Judges about the birth of, or really the prophecy of the birth of Shimshon, birth of Samson. And once again, page 1181 in Shelftim, Judges 13, 2, says there was a certain man of Thor of the Dunite family. He was a, from a family of the tribe of Dun, whose name was Manoach. His wife was barren and had not given birth. An angel of God appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, now you are barren and have not given birth, but you shall conceive and give birth for, to a son. And now be careful not to drink wine or intoxicant and not to eat anything prohibited to Nazarite. For you shall conceive and give birth to a son. A razor shall not come upon his head, for the lad shall be a Nazarite of God from the womb. He will begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So you see already the obvious connection to the Parsha that um, we have. The, the Parsha had the mitzvah of a Nazarite, and here... He's commanded, he, she has a prophecy that he should be a Nazarite from birth, from the womb. And in verse 8, 
And um, in verse six, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The woman came and told her husband what happened and what he said. And in verse eight, it states, Menoch prayed to Hashem and said, please, my Lord, may the man of God whom you sent come now and again to us and teach us what we should do to the lad who will be born. And the commentaries ask already that what's he asking for? The, the angel already told his wife what they should do with the lad who would be born. What's his question here? And then in verse nine, God heeded the call of Menoch. The angel of God came to the woman when she was sitting in the field, but Menoch, her husband, was not with her. Again, again, the angel didn't come to Menoch. It came to his wife. And the woman hastened, turned to page 1182, and ran and told her husband. She said to him, behold, the man who came to me that day appeared to me. Menoch stood up and went after his wife. He came to the man and said to him, are you the man who spoke to the, to the woman? He said, I am. Menoch said, now your words shall come true. What should be the conduct of the lad in his behavior? Which once again, the angel told his wife already. And in verse 13, the angel of God said to Menoch, of everything that I spoke to the woman, let her beware. Of anything that comes from the grapevine, she shall not eat. Wine or intoxicant, she shall not drink. And anything prohibited to Nazareth, she shall not eat. Everything that I commanded her, she shall observe. And that's the end of the conversation, really. And he didn't add anything. So what was this? What was Menoch's issue? Why did he need this angel again? And um, why was he satisfied if he wanted something more and the angel didn't add anything? So um, Rav Shimon Schwab answers, and I believe I heard this also in the, in the name of Rav Palm, that he, he wasn't asking how, what, what, the, his, what the son who will be born should do. That he never had a question because like we said, the angel told his wife. His question was, how do you raise someone to, be, how do you raise someone to be different? Because the kid, this kid is gonna be growing up and um, everyone around him is going to be drinking wine. His friend, the rabbi's son, the rabbi will be drinking kiddish. And you're gonna have to be telling him, no, you can't have that. And everyone, you know, on their third, everyone gets their hair cut and you're gonna have to be telling him, no, you, you can't get a haircut. And the, the, hair's, the eye, hair's gonna be getting in his eyes everywhere. And he'd say, no, you can't do that. How do you raise a kid like that to be different from everyone else? Even people that he's taught to respect and to be people who are taught to be role models, he has to be different than them and can't do things that they're doing. And to that, that was his question. How do we raise this child? And that the angel answered in verse 13, once again, of everything that I spoke to the woman, let her beware. The Hebrew is Tisha Mer. That could also be mean you have to guard. And his point was, and it ends off also in the end of verse 14, everything that I commanded her, Tishmar, that could be read as you should be careful, meaning that not only does the, that the, he's right, meaning he has a very good question, how do you raise a child to be different? How do you raise a child to that they, they can't do things that other everyone around them are, is doing? And the answer is, you can't. The only way to do it is if you model it for them. And he says, you have to keep this, meaning Manoach, you have to become a Nazarite. You, you, you have to stay away from wine. You can't cut your hair. And that way you're able to teach your child not to do these things as well, because as they say, that you tell a kid to do as I say, not as I do, that won't work. That never works. That in order to, if you want, to, if you want a kid to, to have good behavior and to, you need to model that behavior. You have to demonstrate that you, that you have these values. And if you demonstrate the values, you have a chance with a kid. But if you can't tell a kid to have values that you don't have yourself and to keep behavior that you don't keep yourself. Okay, and then it continues that the angel, they brought an offering, the angel left. And in um, verse 24, the end of the Haftarah, the Haftarah concludes, the woman gave birth to a son. She called his name Samson, Shimshon. The lad grew and Hashem blessed him. The spirit of Hashem began to resound in the camp of Dan between Torah and Eshtael. Hey, good job.